Hey, everybody. Welcome to this special edition of the Audio Programmer Meetup. And uh, we are here today to talk about the Web Audio API. So there are a lot of questions that come from the community in terms of how to make uh, music and how to create uh, music making tools within the browser. And so we have invited uh, Hong Chan Choi, who is from Google, to uh, to come and, and uh, talk about the Web Audio API. Uh, this is a very exciting um, event for me because as a person that doesn't know a whole lot about making uh, audio and audio uh, tools within the web, uh, this is a little bit of a selfish um, <clears throat> itch for me to actually be able to uh, to learn more about this and learn about where everything is heading. So uh, just to talk about Hong Chan, Hong Chan is a uh, musician slash engineer who pushes the boundaries of the open web platform for music technology. He's currently a technical lead and manager at Google Chrome and also co-chair of the W3C Audio Working Group. How are you doing, Hong Chen? I'm doing fine. Thanks for having me, Josh. I'm, I'm yeah. honored to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, maybe a place that we could start is just to talk a little bit about um, about your role at Google uh, right. and how uh, how that works within the web audio world and also about W3C. Uh, what is that and what is your role there? Okay. So, yeah, I mean, you already uh, gave a quick introduction for my... Uh, multiple role and job description there. But uh, yeah, I'm technical lead and manager of uh, in, in Google Chrome browser team. And the area that, that I'm working on is web music technology. So our team does anything, everything involved, involved with the uh, web audio API and also web BD API. And we are also involved with some other audio functionality in a Chrome browser team. Um, I'm also uh, doing some management, like people management for a uh, device API team. Uh, device API team, uh, they, they are responsible for uh, shipping APIs like web USB, web Bluetooth, web HID, like peripheral stuff. So I think it's a very interesting uh, overlap and intersection because uh, uh, our umbrella team is something called uh, uh, web capability teams within a Chrome browser and our responsibility as a like whole collective effort is basically uh, developing new API, new capabilities for web browser that hasn't like existed in the past. So mm. web audio, web MIDI, web USB, all of things are pretty much, it sounds, it might sound like unfamiliar to you, but we're, we have been working on this like very long time mm -hmm. and bringing new capabilities to the platform to make it more useful and capable to, for everyone is our mission, basically. And also, i like to talk a little bit about my work in W3C. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, what the W3C actually does for, uh, does for uh, uh, web, it's a, it, it's, it stands for a World Wide Web Consortium. So its main function is basically uh, uh, providing a governance over over the web standards, web, web specification. And uh, it has a very uh, complicated like structure and overall overall architecture, how we actually manage those web standards uh, so a web browser can implement those things. But my uh, specialty or my area in W3C is I'm, I'm chairing or something called the working group. Uh, and Working group is a collective effort of uh, like industry stakeholders for some certain topics. For in our case, it's audio. So in our audio working group, we have uh, participants like uh, from um, BBC and Google and Mozilla and also other audio related company. So we basically have a group and we have a biweekly teleconference to talk about how we create uh, new capabilities for audio developers or audio programmer, just like everyone in this uh, audience in this channel. So we want to make a web platform uh, be more useful uh, for anyone who are interested in developing uh, application, audio application that runs in the browser. Does that explain 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Absolutely. So I'm I'm curious about uh, I'm curious more about the W3C working group. Uh-huh. Uh, so how often do you meet, and what things get discussed in those working groups? Yeah. So we do have a GitHub repository because uh, we do. We also do have a certain process that we need to follow because we are part of W3C and W3C has a really a detailed process for the like document product production because it's going to be standard for many, many years, right? So uh, our cadence for uh, this meeting is bi-weekly and, and we try to have uh, one of them, like but what it means is basically we're gonna have two meetings per month. And one of them is working group meeting. And the other one, we are trying to have a community group meeting. So there are two different groups, but they're kind of same people. Mm-hmm. And, but they do have a same, uh, they do have a different purpose because working group, they are responsible for uh, producing actual web standard. Mm-hmm. Community group is not so much. It's just like, a, it's very friendly and casual group. So we can talk about anything audio and web browser. So if you're interested in like uh, uh, engaging or participating in this discussion, you are welcome to join us in a community group meeting. Amazing. Right. So W3C, am I right? In, and I'll be embarrassed if I'm wrong about this. Is this the one that, is this the entity that Tim Berners-Lee started? Correct. Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's, okay. he's definitely uh, uh, the highest point of the leadership in W3C, yes. Okay, great, great. And so, um, so this is actually establishing um, standards for the entire web of mm. how things are, are going to operate. Very interesting. Um, and how does that how does that work crossover? So when you attend these meetings, do you come back then to, uh, to your day job with Google or with with Chrome? And do you have a responsibility to relay these back or how does that work? Yes, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, I would say it's a constant feedback loop basically Mm. Uh, because as a a, like engineering team uh, under Google Chrome, we have things that we want to do. There are some certain priorities that we believe that this is important for audio developer to be successful in the web platform. So we have our own priority. So we bring those to the meeting and we talk about those things and we try to build a consensus between other stakeholders, right? Uh, other browser implementers such as Mozilla or uh, Apple, they build Safari, uh, they might have different ideas. So we actually uh, uh, go through quite like intense discussion, technical discussion to have a, like agreement on certain new features. Then once we have that, we can actually bring back that into our engineering process and build and ship those API in the browser. Right. This process goes in on and on. And uh, we started this whole effort in 2010, actually. Got so it. it's been a while. So how do you come to a consensus between things? So everybody, you know, Mozilla, um, Apple, you know, all of these entities all have their differing priorities. Is this done by a vote? Does it need to be unanimous in order for a change to happen? Um, how, do you, um, how do you move forward? Yeah, if, if, the con- if the building a consensus is impossible, we can vote. That's one uh, like uh, W3C working group can do. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, leadership of the working group can actually uh, uh, start a vote if there is uh, no consensus to be made in the end. But that hasn't been, that hasn't been a case for our group. Uh, we always try to come up with the agreement and consensus. If we cannot reach a consensus for some reason, basically what we do is we're gonna punt that discussion for uh, like a couple of months and we're gonna talk about later maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's interesting. And um, from from your experience, what do you feel the consensus of where uh, where we would like to go with web audio is? What what would that experience look like in the future? Uh, you mean the building a consensus? Yeah, just in terms of so you said that a lot of times um, you come you in, you do end up coming to a consensus on what the direction is uh-huh. that most. Right. Uh, mo- it sounds like most of your group have a similar vision on. Yeah 
where you would like to see web and audio and where, what the future of that looks like. So what, right. yep. what would you That's like to see as the ultimate vision or what's your interpretation of the ultimate vision of what that's going to look like in the future? Does that mean that? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the vision can be very personal thing. So what, I, what I'm going to talk about is my personal opinion, right? right. Uh, but in the future, uh, just for like short, short term or long term, there are different perspective, but I'm talking about the short term because uh, uh, the project that we are currently working on in the Chrome team and also W3C audio working group is we want to provide more low level API to web uh, web developers or audio programmers because, uh, because it's the nature of a web browser that we don't expose a lot of things because we believe that uh, web browser, uh, adding a powerful feature to the web browser can be extremely dangerous. Right. Because uh, it's like, a, in enormous reach, right? Everyone uses uses web browser somehow every day. So, if we if we're not careful enough when shipping a new API, it might actually lead to the big disaster. Mm -hmm. So, like so, uh, like Spider Man with great great with great power. Exactly. Coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to use that quote because I've done that so many times. <laughs> you you said it for me, so uh, it's uh, so it's okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's okay. Um, so I think the, the most important thing here is still, we want to be successful as a platform. And if we have a significant and critical feature gaps between native platforms and web platform, developers will, that will basically drive away developers. And I don't want that uh, to happen. So, uh, our focus is how, how do we bring uh, this low level audio API into the web platform without hurting user security and privacy. So that hasn't been a focus of the last one or two years in the working group discussion, because I think we shipped a lot of API features and APIs already in the web audio API, part of the web audio API. And the things that has, the things, uh, the, the things that remain so far is basically really powerful things. How do we expose low level audio callback to the web developers. That's mm -hmm. one of the examples. And outcome of that discussion was something called the audio worklet, which is now quite popular in many types of web audio applications. Mm -hmm. So just to give you some context there, um, before audio worklet, uh, web audio API didn't give you this low level uh, controllability. We just give you some uh, basic building blocks to you so you can build audio graph oscillator node, bycode filter node, compressor node. So you, by connecting those building blocks, you can create your audio applications or sound effects. But as an audio programmer, as you already know, no, 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 no. I want to implement my own DSP. Right. How do I do that? And audio workload was basically our working group's response to that developer's demand. So that happened, and now Audio Worklet is uh, shipped in Chrome and Firefox and Safari everywhere. So if you build uh, your audio application, your own DSP with the Audio Worklet API, then it's supposed to be uh, compatible on every major browsers. Got it. So that's one example. And something that we are currently working on, our, our Chrome Web Audio team is currently working on, is um, the Render Capacity API. Render capacity means that, uh, I guess, like the most like, simplest use case of that API would be CPU gauge in your DAW, mm -hmm. right? And it looks very uh, natural and it looks very uh, tiny, but it caused a huge security related discussion because it's basically exposing your CPU profile to random JavaScript code. So we be, we are kind of going through we, right now. We are going through this privacy and security discussion. We're trying to make some consensus between browser vendors, and also within our engineering team. And basically, my responsibility is drive the discussion so we can have any any form of outcome so developer developers can use that feature. I see. So going back to the audio worklet. Uh, yeah. Building custom DSP. When you're building your mm -hmm. custom DSP, 
uh, what language is that using? How are you actually building that? This is a web platform we were talking about. So everything is JavaScript. Right. Great. Right. Okay. Yeah. So and is... okay. if you're not familiar with JavaScript, uh, still there there is a way to do that. And this is one of uh, one of the topic uh, that I actually presented in the Google I/O 2019. If you already have a functioning and working C++ audio processing code, you can use something called mscript. So mscript is a transpiler that transpile C++ code into WebAssembly, which is, is a kind of subset of a, a subset of a, a JavaScript. So nowadays I've, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh, web audio application is using that design pattern. So because uh, they are audio company, they already have C++ audio code like from the, their legacy system and they didn't want to rewrite everything from scratch with JavaScript, it's just too much work for nothing, right? right. So usually a uh, really like approachable, accessible development path for them is using this mscript to produce a WASM web assembly and put that module uh, into audio workload system. Then uh, web audio's rendering thread will run those WASM code to process and generate audio from it. Very interesting. Um, we have a great question this on this topic from mm -hmm. Scott in the chat, who says, uh, who asked, do you have anyone in your working group who's focused on accessibility, such as assistive tech? If not yet, I'd love to help get some of those use cases represented. Oh, you, you are welcome to join us in our community discussion. Yeah, I mean, accessibility is the one thing that, uh, that we don't get discussed much because we don't have any experts in our group. Mm -hmm. And also I'm curious what kind of use case can be made for accessibility from web audio API perspective. Maybe um, um, speech generation out of UI elements, maybe that might be one case. I think a web browser already has that kind of a capability, which is kind of outside of web audio API. So there, there is a web API for speech generation, text to speech generation or speech recognition. They are actually out of web audio API. But if you want to build your own to speech recognition generation, you can certainly do that by using C++ WASM pattern too. So amazing. So if Scott wanted to join uh, this community group. How could how could he join? I'm putting you on the spot right now. Yep. Right now. Yep. That's right thing to do and I'm sending you a link so we can share in our YouTube channel. Right. So uh, yeah, I believe all you need to type in is your email address, probably your name. Okay, I'm pasting it in our chat now. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, and uh, Stefan Letts from the Faust team also Right. Um, pointed out that you can also use domain specific languages such as uh, Faust or Faust. Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Hello, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, we work together when we're uh, piloting and ex uh, like experimenting with the audio workload, only designable audio workload in Chrome. I really appreciate his support and help in this project. Yes. Amazing. So, um, so we have another question. Uh, from Mantis Shrimp, who oh, asked, okay. uh, this is a little bit more of a technical question. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I've run into is using so much memory that I crashed the tab. As far as I know, there's not much the browser does to tell you when you're in trouble. Low memory events would be great. What do you recommend? Um, I believe there, there are some proposal around that idea. One of them is a memory pressure API. Uh, let me uh, Google it up quickly, but I'm not sure the uh, cross-browser compatibility of that API yet. So let's see. So uh, here's the explainer of that API. So it looks like a, it's kind of a uh, only phase discussion. Okay, I will put this in the chat. Right. I mean, obviously, uh, from developer perspective, uh, this type of API can be extremely useful 
but also we, as a web platform engineer, we have to think about its implication from user security and uh, the privacy. Mm -hmm. Because um, having this kind of information can be really uh, useful for those type of exploit. Great. Uh, so there's a, another question from mm -hmm. Sydney who asks, um, do you need additional hardware to get started with using the, the web audio API or? Not at all, not at all. Uh, I think uh, the most comprehensive introductory article is actually MDN. This is something, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, please ignore that link. I'm gonna send another link to you, Josh. So that has really nice introduction. Uh, if you just follow and the, uh, and also if you follow some code example in the article, I think that will be the easiest way to get on board. But you don't need anything other than browsers. Uh, but if your computer somehow doesn't have any microphone or speaker, then it might be a different issue. <laughs> but usually uh, computers these days comes with the, the like built-in speakers, so. Amazing. So there's a uh, question from Mark S who asks, I'm curious what the future of multi-channel is in web audio. Will there ever be support for something like 32 channels? Okay, this question has multiple layers onto it. Uh, I think the first problem that we want to solve in Chrome, I'm not sure about the current status of other browser. Uh, I can only speak for Chrome. Uh, we don't support multi-channel input. That's, a, that's our kind of a limitation. And, and I can talk more about its context, but um, in terms of internal processing in Web Audio API itself, the entire audio path in Web Audio API is a 32-bit floating point, and it, it needs to support up to 32 channels. That's a minimum. So if the browser implementers are passionate about like channel count of your internal audio processing, they can go up to like uh, 128 or something like that. But the minimum, in order to be a spec compliant, the browser implementation needs to support up to 32 audio channel within Web Audio API. And also the, then the next issue will be output. Uh, uh, in the output, I believe the Chrome can support up to eight channels at the moment. Right. And we can, we can certainly extend uh, the number of channels supported for their uh, output, but uh, we haven't had a lot of uh, developer requests that, might, that requires like 32 or 128 channel output yet. Right. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that I was very curious about as a person mm -hmm loves a little bit of history was just to hear a little bit about your experience up until now, since you've started working uh, on the web audio API and in W3C mm. and get an understanding of what were the challenges that you faced when you first, uh, when you first joined and what progress, what are, what are some of the significant um, achievements that you've, that you've had and breakthroughs that you've had in the web audio API mm. over the past, uh, over the past nine years? Um, I think uh, there are like multiple angles into this question. Um, my experience, let me talk about the achievement that our group made first, maybe. Uh, I guess like most, the, the biggest one that I can remember is shipping Web Audio API as a W3C recommendation. So web standard, web specification has its own life cycle. Usually it started from working draft or editor's draft. Uh, in that phase, this web, uh, this uh, standard document doesn't have like much of binding. It's not even contract a contract between browsers. It's just like early stage of a draft, so it doesn't it it doesn't have a lot of power over it or authority. But as time goes, when we uh, we have more working group discussion and also we kind of uh, apply for the advancement of those status uh, document status, then we move on to something called candidate recommendation. Then eventually it ended up in the W3C official recommendation. It means that 
it has a little bit of binding nature. So it's a officially recommended by W3C and all, uh, all the imp uh, browser implementers, they need to actually follow those spec. So uh, recommendation usually comes with uh, like accompanying um, a web platform test suite. So we do have a common test set for to, uh, to be a uh, spec compliant for uh, current specification. So I guess it's more of a more, more enforceable. Also, you can actually blame someone if, if someone is some, lacking some features that is in our recommended specification. As a developer, you can say, hey, spec says this, you need to implement this. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's that in, in that sense, uh, shipping web audio API specification as a W3C recommendation is uh, one of the biggest achievements that our group made. Amazing. Yeah. And um, what type of applications did you, uh, because I imagine that as you make tools available for developers to, mm -hmm. uh, to, create, to create things that you have a vision and maybe we could talk a little bit just about the challenges of creating an API. Mm -hmm without necessarily knowing what type of op, uh, audio applications that I see to create um, a little bit about that, the challenges around having an API, trying to keep it open and creative enough where people can take those building blocks, but at the same time, um, you know, that there is, that there is actually something there, something substantial there where they don't, they're not starting from scratch. Right. I have uh, some 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 thoughts on this topic because I I've been in, I've been involved in this API discussion and design discussion uh, uh, like 2014 because that's when I joined this working group as a, a like mem official member and early stage of a design uh, the design discussion usually started from the gut. It's a very weird thing to say, but that's that's that was, that's kind of my understanding that people thought, people just vaguely thought, yeah, this type of API might be useful for developers, so we should do it. And I don't think uh, it's a, a great pattern to have uh, in terms of like designing uh, a comprehensive and thoughtful API. So I think. At the uh, more, more recently, I think our working group has been taking approaches more based on the data, data-driven development. Uh, basically, we collecting actual opinion from developers. So we, I think we've been doing a developer survey like a couple of years back, basically asking developers that what kind of API do you want? What kind of use case do you have in mind? And uh, how can we help? So. The response was very interesting actually to see because uh, it usually means that the gut that we had in the past is pretty uh, <laughs> pretty wrong and in inaccurate. Uh, but I still believe that that's the right way to work on the API because we need to ship API that, uh, that people want, not what we want to see in the platform. Right. So as a platform engineer, uh, not having uh, like subjective opinions on uh, what API is needed and what API needs to be shipped is important. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about what that data is saying or what feedback that you've received that uh, it sounds like you may have been surprised by what developers are looking for. Can you tell us? Okay, about yeah, sure. Uh, let me search up my Google Drive because we have actually a presentation uh, that I made in a couple of years back. Uh, can you give me like one minute? Is that is that okay? Oh yeah, of course. And uh, and for everybody that's been asking questions, we've been having plenty. Um, Hong Chan and I have concerns that we wouldn't have enough questions, but people are flooding through with some fantastic. Oh, no. And we hope to uh, we hope to get to all of those. So uh, so yeah, so hold tight, and we will address all of them. Uh, but thank you. Please keep them coming through. Okay. Uh, 
I'm gonna share. Oh, it says I cannot share my screen. Um, oh yes. What's okay. what's the best way to share? Give me one moment, and I will give you the uh, the power here. Here we go. Thank you. All right, you should be good now. Okay. Yeah, this is just one example. This is something I shared in our annual conference for web platform engineer. Can you see the screen? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So, I'm not going to go into the detail, um, but um, these are the like summary. And the question that we're asking is something like this: Select an audio device for web audio input and output. And obviously, it was hugely popular. Everyone wants this feature, so that's why we shipped this feature all these here. So now with the Web Audio API, you can actually select your own uh, dedicated audio device. So that's kind of a, what, I'm, what I meant by uh, data-driven development. Mm -hmm. We ship API because people want that. And configure the audio device for my needs, sample rate, number of channels, because uh, certainly uh, currently this is not, uh, this was not possible, but currently it's possible because we ship the device selection API. So you can actually set a uh, uh, number of channel and sample rate that you want in the construction of audio context, which is the main object of a web audio API. So, and this type of things, if there's a, a changes in audio device, I want to get notified. Yes, we, we know that. And we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to prioritize this work as well. So this question just goes on and on, right? But at the end, I try to capture uh, uh, people's demand people's like uh, uh, request in this list. Uh, it, as you can see, the line item in the red color means that higher priority because that's many, that's more more people want this feature. So uh, if you look at those lists, uh, all selecting audio device and using WASM uh, more efficiently with audio workload, getting some notification from the device selection, device change and configure audio device for my needs, and it, this just goes in on and on. So this is kind of a, one of the example that we do as a developer survey. And we basically feed data back into the working groups uh, prioritization and also our engineering teams prioritization. Amazing. And can you tell us a little bit about how many people took this survey? Uh, where did those, where did those people, where did you derive those people from and so on? Yeah. So, um, this summary actually shows that uh, we had 88 responses. And I think the one before this one actually had uh, more than 120 responses. And I don't have uh, many people, many connection through Twitter or LinkedIn, but yeah, this was kind of a result uh, from that social media posting. <laughs> Very nice. Great. It's fantastic. All right. I'm going to stop share my screen. Yep. OK, great. All right. Uh, so we we have um, some more some more questions. And mm -hmm. uh, so Peter, uh, Peter Woods asks uh, this may be a little bit related to the question that you asked before regarding um, getting some benchmarks and uh, CPU usage and things like right. that. Right. OK. Yeah. Do you have any tips on testing? We've had issues that are hardware specific, but we but we can't buy lots of devices. Um, farms don't generally support audio, making it uh, really hard to test mobile mm -hmm. device. Farms. Um, yeah, so I don't have really a good answer for this. It's because uh, we are kind of in this similar situation in web audio team. We don't have a lot of audio device. And also we don't have a lot of mobile phone that we can test with. I mean, we can always ask, but uh, we are also company. Uh, we, we don't, I, I don't have like unlimited source of funding that we can buy those devices. But yeah, I, I feel for uh, Peter, um, I hope there's a better answer for this, but that's pretty much what we have in Chrome Web Audio team as well. We only have like uh, three or four devices so far, yeah. Okay. And Phone Macist 
asks, what are the considerations for, for performance and sample accuracy when porting C++ code to the web? Um, performance wise, I think the performance can mean a lot of things, but um, if you just like looking for a uh, number of number of audio audio data, it's really hard to uh, say that. But um, for example, when you have a lot of audio nodes in audio graph, like too many oscillator nodes or too many of uh, a uh, bicode field or compressor node, then you're gonna get glitches because the web audio API is based on pool based audio renderer means that you're basically getting a uh, regular audio callback from the platform. So if you don't finish your job in time, you're gonna get glitches. Um, yeah, we provide a little bit of a, a tools to uh, tools for developers uh, to avoid that kind of situation. And one of them is, I, I actually wrote an article about this. So this might not be a perfect answer, but, uh, but this is, of things that you can try if you want to profile the performance of your web audio application. And uh, in terms of WASM performance, uh, that uh, there's not much of we can do from web audio perspective because, like I like I uh, mentioned, uh, WASM is just completely completely different beast. It's a part of a, a VA JavaScript engine, so. If they have a performance improvement somehow, we will benefit from it. But uh, from web audio perspective, there's a, that much we can do. Okay. And we have a question, another question from Manta Shrimp, who asks, okay. at some point, Firefox had a visual web audio debugger that looked a little bit like pure data. Are there any plans for web audio specific dev tools? We already have, so I just sent you. I'm, I just passed it, pasted a link there, and this one is a, a extension for Chrome Dev Tool, but I believe it also can be modified to work in Firefox as well. So this is something you install into your browser. Then, if you go to Dev Tool, there will be additional panel for audio, the visual debugging for your audio graph. Great. Uh, Redetach asks, is there any kind of machine learning research being done in the web audio API? Anything similar to Llama 2? Um, web audio API can be used for client side playback, playout, basically. But if you want to have this, uh, some, some sort of integration, incorporation of this large language model, I haven't seen any uh, notable example yet because it's just too early. And also, as you already know, the larger language model is usually really, really big. So having to download like five gigabytes of a language model just to run one web application might not be so practical. That's why um, I'm seeing more this AI powered audio application usually have this hybrid architecture and design. So a lot of AI ML, power, ML powered audio processing happens on the server side and usually client side is just responsible for a glitchless audio playout. Mm. How, how do we manage the uh, stability of this uh, audio stream from the server and client? And also how do we synchronize this multiple stream from server so you can play the multiple tracks without any synchronization issues? Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from Steve Hine who asks, uh, Wasm has a memory limit of four gig. Do hmm. you have insight into this limit or have reason to expect it to change? I can imagine use cases such as audio inference models right. exceeding this limit. Right, so it's the same situation, same, same question basically, <clears throat> right? So if you want to have some sort of inference based on larger language model, you, you have to have that model either like local, like client side or server side, right? Uh, obviously uh, having a larger language model, the client side, had, uh, it's, it might not be like possible because of this memory limitation that Chrome has. But if we have more requests from developers, I think those limitations can be uh, revised mm. because it's, uh, we have our own principle and rule 
but those principle and rule is based on the trend and the developer needs as well. So I think the best way to make that change or best way to uh, get that kind of change faster is just speak up for your uh, demand and needs. Uh, we have, I, I believe uh, if you look up in clbug.com, I'm pasting a link here. This is our uh, issue tracker for any kind of Chromium development uh, uh, purpose. If you try to look up the memory limitation, memory restriction here in this issue tracker, you will find some bug entry or some request from developers. You can always chime in there, hey, I need this too. I think this is a good idea, please support for me. If by just saying so, uh, basically uh, it's a small, a small thing to do, but our Chrome team engineers are, are taking this pretty seriously. That's great. Uh, Kostas asks, could you discuss appropriate WebRTC constraints for using microphone inputs, especially on mobile devices? <clears throat> Settings such as AEC seem optimized for voice and bandwidth instead of audio fidelity. Mm, that's correct. Um, I'm sure this topic has some uh, it has some discussion on MDN as well. But if you want to have like raw PCM from this microphone input, there are certain switches that needs to be turned off. Like you don't want to have echo cancellation, or you don't want to have automatic gate control (AGC), and also you don't want to have a noise suppression, etc. So if you turn off all of these switches the audio stream from GetUsion Media into web audio will be just raw PCM data, basically. If not, we need to talk about that. That sounds like a bug. Um, Save, Save Me asks, I have been trying to apply NIST curves as compression curves some time ago. Is it possible to implement something like that in the web audio API? Um, we do have a compressor node the pre-built compressor node you can use, which is highly optimized C++ code. So if somehow this does not uh, satisfy your needs and you want to implement your own uh, DSP code for a, a compressor, the audio worklet is the way, basically. If you, if you want to have something custom, you can always implement your own thing in the audio worklet. Right. So would the output of the audio worklet be, be a node then? Then you can- Yes. Yes, correct. So it's uh, in terms of its architecture, it has two side of things. Uh, it has audio worklet node, and also it has a, a associated audio worklet processor. So audio worklet processor is the actual JavaScript code that will run on audio thread to process or generate audio code. But audio worklet node is more of a main thread representation, so you can just use it as a like pre-built building block. Um, Aaron asks, uh, with, with a large focus or a larger focus on WASM in the web audio API, do you have info if chunked audio decoding will be supported in the standard API in the future? Currently tracks have to be fully decoded at once. Yes, we do have a plan for this, uh, for our team, we are targeting to work on this next year, 2024, because this has been a problem uh, for many developers, just to give you some context. Um, so in audio web audio API, there are two different types of uh, um, two different types of audio context. Audio context is the kind of mothership object of all audio operation, web audio operation. So you have to create this one first, then out of this context, you can create oscillator filter, compressor, convolver. So this basically context is your audio playground. But there are two types of a uh, uh, playground. One of them is a real-time audio context, as the name suggests. Uh, whatever you do with this context, it will give you real-time audio output. And the other type is offline audio context. This one is kind of interesting because it doesn't really output any real-time audio, but it will give you the rendered audio data as a buffer. So you can, uh, I guess like one 
representative use case of this feature is if you're building DAW, then obviously you need to have a functionality like export or render, right? For that kind of feature can be implemented by this offline audio context because it's not real time. It will just render your audio graph as fast as a thread can do, right? But the problem here is what if your project size is just too big, so it's going to be like your audio buffer will be more than four gigabytes, right? If that happens, unfortunately, right now, our audio offline audio context just crashes because out of memory issue. So uh, uh, our audio working group is trying to come up with a new way of, uh, of rendering audio progressively and incrementally without processing the whole thing just at once. And we already had discussion and everyone believed this is a good, good idea. So it's only a matter of a prioritization. What are some of the most exciting web audio applications that you've seen in your experience and seeing best use of uh, the web yeah. audio? I've seen so many, and also I like to be a little bit impartial here. Um, but one thing I can recommend without any hesitation is something, uh, it's an application from Ableton. So Ableton uh, created uh, like web, web page project, like uh, learning music and learning synths. And it's the, like, the best practice and best example about what web audio app can be and what can do, what you can do with the web audio API. Yeah, that's a very exciting page. Yeah, and also uh, the other, Example that I'm that I was kind of very excited to see was uh, is a heard sound. It's a web-based DAW, but also it's powered by this machine learning technology. So it can it, it can do uh, like on-demand source separation when you have a like completed mix. It can actually separate it out to the multiple stem of each track, and it can do a lot of amazing things. I I was gonna kind of, yeah. It was mind blown for me. And the other thing that is currently actively used by professional is something called the clean feed. It's a, um, it's a recording studio, but it's a distributed by nature. So you can have uh, a voiceover recording or you can have a podcast recording, for example, in high quality audio. Uh, even when the participants of a podcast is like, all, they are all different countries. And they got the uh, Emmy Award for their achievement. So that was a super uh, exciting moment for me to see that's happening. <laughs> Amazing. What was the name of that project again? The Clean Feed. Uh, let me give you the link. Put it into the chat as well. Here. Also, the ML powered uh, digital audio workstation is this. Yeah, I don't think the application itself is public yet, but they have really, uh, a really exciting uh, demonstration. Amazing. And, and is this where you feel that the, uh, that music technology is heading in the future towards, towards the browser? Is that uh, what the vision would be? Or is it, or do you feel that, uh, because, you know, as we know, there are so many applications that were native uh, that have now moved to the browser and, um, hmm. you know, see audio moving that way or do you think it will be split? I don't think so not necessarily because I uh, when I when I get this kind of question I usually come up uh, I, the metaphor that I usually use is Microsoft Word Microsoft Word has been there forever and Google that came along and many people like sold sold by the sold by this idea that yeah this is cloud and I can access anywhere is you can share your document with the link. It's just so attractive, right? But it didn't mean the extinction of Microsoft Word. Right. 
they're just like complementing each other. They're, it's, it's more of like uh, replacing one product with another or one platform with another. It's more of we're going to have more platforms so that we can work on. So it's more of expanding the ecosystem and or, or entire platform platform, but not about replacing one with another. That's how I see it. Yeah. What about hybrid? Have, have you seen any hybrid platforms that where you have some functionality that maybe may be in the browser and it correlates with a native application? This is something that I was daydreaming about a little mm. bit earlier today and wondering if any any such thing exists. Yes, yes, it does. Um, there, there's a Apple, the web application called Audio Tool. Let me give you the link. So I, I love this application. Uh, I, I said I don't want to be partial to talk about this uh, so many application, but this one just so excites me because it has really nice user interface. Everything is draggable. Everything is like modifiable. Uh, it's a modular structure. Um, but one interesting thing that I heard from the developer of this project was you can also install Node.js server locally. And that server actually is capable of running VSD plugins. Wow. So your, your web app actually can talk to this local server and you can run your own like favorite VSD plugins to get the data back. It's more of a uh, hybrid version of a rewire system, you know? Yeah, wow. Yeah, the reason, reason rack as a VSD plugin, it's the same concept. I thought it was really clever. That is that is awesome. I haven't heard of that. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Do you, do you think that getting VSTs um, working or somehow having a translation layer from VST into um, Web Audio? Do you feel that that's one of the more significant challenges that we face for web-based? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there will be like one-to-one -one mapping between VST plugin into audio worklet node. If that's possible, it's good. I'm pretty sure there are uh, some people are working on this idea. Uh, probably we're going to see something interesting in the future. Um, but yeah, this VST plugin is one of the thing uh, that our audio working group had a discussion, but we couldn't, we couldn't actually produce an interesting idea from it. Mm. Um, it's a third party code and that might be run under uh, under you know the high priority rendering thread and plugin structure is always risky in terms of security and uh, privacy um, so that's why this uh, alternate alternative design a project like audio tools kind of exciting because you can have your own thing yeah um, yeah it seems interesting it seems like from the native, from the native side, there's a lot of desire to use web tools, whether it's using web tools for user interface or whether there's a discussion about portability between having mm -hmm. uh, the VST version. Of course, the dream for VST uh, vendors would be to have the VST version of their plugin, but have a web audio version. Yes, that yes would be able to um i guess like one effort that i can think of is actually from cycling 74 mm. they are vendor of a max msp jitter which i still i, I believe they're part of a able to now um, right. but they recently um launched a project called the rainbow mm -hmm. so if you have a max msp patcher that uh, then you can actually export that patcher into uh, some some plugin format or even for web audio. So there is a like uh, your your patching system became, becomes like a meta audio processing uh, sketchbook or whatever. Then you can actually uh, export that into VS plugins or other uh, web stuff or even more more exotic stuff in the future. Yeah. yeah. Very powerful. And I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the learning sense uh, page mm. that you mentioned earlier was actually built using Rainbow. Correct. Yes. So, so yeah, very... thank, yeah, yeah. Thanks for acknowledging that. <laughs> yeah, very, very exciting. And yes. um, yeah, there are a couple, there are a couple um, um, 
different entities that are converging on these types of solutions. C major is mm -hmm. one uh, very exciting. Um, you know, being able to write your code once and being being having the ability right. to write multiple destinations. Yeah, of course. You know that means also having your uh, your user interface follow along with that as well. Uh, right. So yeah. Challenge. But I suppose that if you're writing that user interface in JavaScript or some, you know, in React, that that makes that makes things so much more possible and, mm -hmm. and important for that. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting. What have been your biggest challenges in terms of the web audio API? So, mm. uh, you know, one that I, that immediately comes to mind is just thinking about me MIDI and the real time synchronization between. Um, you know, a signal that you're initiating locally from your MIDI keyboard, and now it needs to go over a server and needs to have that reaction time that mm. uh, feels like real time. Would you say that that's one of the larger challenges that you're facing, or are there other ones that you feel mm. that, that are more significant? I mean, in terms of a technical thing, um, web browser is general computing platform. So we cannot get around that principle. So it means that even if the web audio actually takes an approach to avoid some of the problems because of uh, that issue, uh, so web audio API is uh, the whole rendering, rendering system is based on the idea of a dual threading architecture. So we have one thread that only manages like connection and graph management and the other thread only focuses on audio rendering. So with this dual thread design, we can avoid uh, audio glitches that can happen because uh, main thread usually involves the like usual interaction, the UI element, up updating UI elements, uh, but audio thread can focus on the audio thing. And this was kind of right idea to begin with, but as the scale of your web application as grows, the main thread gets just busier and busier because it has so many things to do. So now developers are asking that, can we move this audio node management and graph building logic into another separate thread? So there was a demand like that. And I, I, I believe it's a valid one. And MIDI has the same situation. MIDI, uh, MIDI API is pretty high level, actually. Uh, you can create a MIDI access object on the main thread. Once you have that, you can open and close MIDI port on a certain MIDI device. Everything is on the main thread. And Web Audio is also the building graph in the main thread. Main thread does everything. And it's not a great design pattern if you're building larger scale application because main thread usually gets really busy. So if your main thread is struggling, it means that you're gonna, your MIDI data, MIDI event from device will be delayed. Right, because it's in the scheduling and event queue. So how do we avoid those type of problems? I guess uh, obvious answer is we want to support audio context, web audio API and web media API in the worker thread. So that, uh, that idea is already in the issue tracker of audio working group. So uh, I, th I hope we can work on that pretty soon. Amazing. And do you find that you face significant challenges with um, browser specific behavior mm. or would you say that uh, that the performance is, is pretty consistent between browsers or would you say that there are challenges there as well? Oh, there are definitely some challenges. Yes, uh, because uh, some platform has a uh, little bit better in terms of handling audio data. Um, Linux system uh, can be really challenging. Uh, that also kind of a, uh, one of the reason for Chrome is not performing well in terms of a web audio performance in the Linux platform is we're, our audio system is based on pulse audio. And also uh, that audio infrastructure doesn't, doesn't get to use real time priority thread. So you're gonna get more glitches. You're gonna get more scheduling issues there. So there, there is a certain, there, there are certainly some 
some degree of a, a, a platform problems that we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's the kind of challenging that I'm uh, that I can think of. Um, yeah, and am I am I answering your question? Yeah, right? absolutely. So so it sounds like there are two levels of issues be because from I guess from a high level overview, I would hmm. be thinking that using a browser would help us uh, get rid of OS specific challenges, but it sounds like there could be OS specific challenges in there as that are- Oh that yeah, are yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, now I see the point of your question. So our job as a browser engineer is, so we're gonna make the, um, we're gonna make that difference go away ideally. So you don't see any platform difference from a, a developer level. So that's what we want to do. Um, okay. I think we're, we're doing pretty decent job because uh, other teams in Chrome, they work on this audio element and WebRTC. They have done so much work to make the, uh, the create the stable audio infrastructure for uh, many different purposes. I think it's worked generally well because uh, for example, Zoom is using audio workload and outputting audio through uh, our Chrome's audio infrastructure. So based on, it's uh, if you design your application uh, nicely, maybe it will work with the platform nicely too. I think the Zoom's audio engineers also did a pretty uh, good job here. Uh, same thing for YouTube. YouTube uh, uh, web app plays video and audio nicely as well. So I think it, it all depends on the use case, yeah. Right. Yeah. Because uh, I think that there is a tendency from people, maybe from the outside, you know, my, myself, I've even uh, been a proponent of this in thinking that web is the answer to escaping all of uh, the, the woes that we face with uh, DAWs, mm -hmm. which is that you have um, specific behaviors, specific bugs that are specific to a DAW and uh, specific to an operating system. Uh, you, of course, have code signing and notarization challenges. Ah, that, right, right, right. Yeah, that one. You, you know, to, and that you know, from, a, you know, a high level perspective, you would be thinking, oh, well, if we get, if we could just get everything into a browser, then that would solve a lot of those problems because mm. Um, now you don't have to deal with code signing and notarization. People can just open it up on the on the browser and uh, away you go. But it sounds like the challenges just move and those are just different. There are just different types oh, of yeah. challenges. Yeah, I would say that. Also, I think that one big difference in terms of pre-programming principle is that JavaScript is a garbage collected language. Yes. So in C++, you, you have a full control over your, your code in terms of memory management, but JavaScript does not give you that. So many audio developers who started working on JavaScript and WASM, because it, it just looks so uh, attractive and interesting, they always came up with the frustration of, oh, this GC is just bothering me. How do we get rid of this? And, uh, I feel for you. <laughs> and uh, I know there are some effort uh, is, is, being, is being made uh, to bring some level of a garbage collection to the WASM. So I think that's one thing I like to point out today because web platform is, uh, I think it's still pretty fluid. We are still innovating and we are still listening to what you, what you have to say. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you can see, I'm, I'm also trying to always reach out to developers if they have any uh, issues with the Chrome Web Audio code I do a lot of uh, Twitter DMing with the many different developers just to talk about those issues. And we are open to collaboration. So if you have, a, if you have any concern and frustration or any interesting idea, uh, at least what I can do is I'm, I'm, I am going to make myself available for discussion with you. Yeah. Amazing. Um, going back to what you were saying about JavaScript right. thing, garbage collection, how do you how do you get around how do you get around that problem with uh, um, 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 so job uh, garbage collection that happens on the main thread is usually out of your control because uh, 
as a web app, you're displaying UIs and you're you're creating a lot of elements and destroying elements. The garbage collection will soon to happen there. But at least you have a control over uh, what's happening under your audio workload processor, audio rendering thread. Uh, so my recommendation is usually just create all the memory it's needed up front and try not to reallocate or destroy the object while the audio is being processed. Gotcha. If you need, like definitely need some allocation of a, a allocation of big object in the audio thread, uh, perhaps, one workaround you can do is you can actually stop the rendering thread for a moment and do some allocation. Then you resume the audio processing again. You have the control over the like the the renderer's operation. So, right. Um, before we got on this call, you were talking a little bit about uh, the, trying to um, <clears throat> decrease the gap between. Uh, the things that you're working on with web audio and the world of audio programming. Can you talk a little bit about that and what your ambitions are there? Um, yeah, the most recent effort happening in the audio working group has been, uh, we, we, have been, we have been focused on the low level API. How do we bring this low level API to the web audio developers? I mean, the being able to craft an uh, audio graph with this pre-built Lego pieces is okay. It's, it can be done, but how do we expose low-level audio callback? Or how do we expose device-specific information, like number of channels, sampling rate, and what's supported or not? And also, how do we expose uh, like uh, rendering capacity based on your CPU performance? So. Those type of things is something that we want to bring to the table. Uh, once we have that, I think we're gonna. I think uh, the web audio API will be more more complete in terms of like whole picture. And also, uh, many people will ask the question. Yeah, that's all sounds great, but you guys just too slow. <laughs> I understand that. I understand uh, your frustration. But one thing I like to say about that point is. We want to bring those API uh, very carefully because uh, without proper caution in the designing and shipment process, um, all of these low-level APIs, they have, uh, they have a power to make things very dangerous. Mm -hmm. So we definitely want to avoid that situation. That's the whole mission of our umbrella team called Project Fugu. Uh, you know, the Fugu is, is a fish it's a poisonous fish. So if you treat them right, you can actually eat it. It's a really, really like delicate, delicate food in the Asian culture. But if you don't have proper skill set, that that fish will kill you. Yeah. So yeah, that's what we we're, that's what we're trying to do in our team. We want to bring dangerous features so you don't have to deal with those like uh, uh, danger itself. Yeah. Speaking speaking of danger, another aspect of API creation is uh, breaking changes. So hmm. having an API that moves forward at the same time, uh, backwards compatibility, what, it, what are your thoughts and general philosophies around that? Right. Yeah, I, I love the question because that's kind of where web platform excels. So we shipped the web audio API in 2010, like as an old experiment. Uh, I don't think we break anything significantly. I, there's a one noticeable change that happened in 2016 or 17. Um, in the early version of web audio, you didn't have to have a user's initial click on the page. You can just, you, you could just play audio when the page is loaded. But it looks like, a, a, but based on our survey and research, that causes so many issues because some of the like, advertisers are abusing that feature a lot. So it's just blasting your speakers when the page is loaded with advertisements. It's just not great. So we, we made an exception for that case. So now we are we're basically requiring user to click the page at least once. Then you're going to get audio from the audio web audio API. That was, that was a, 
I believe it's a relatively small change that you uh, that you see from other platforms, right? Other platforms usually making breaking changes in audio, and a lot of audio app developers just writing a blog article on their company webpage that please do not install OS something something. But yeah, we don't we don't do that often. I think that the autoplay uh, policy change was the biggest one. Um, also, we don't have any plan to cause uh, that kind of a, a problem, the breaking change in our API in the future. Fantastic. Um, one last question, and maybe, maybe I'll give a couple uh, minutes or a couple seconds or while he's, Hong Chan is an answering this, uh, this question sure. for people to ask any other questions. Uh, what would you like the future to look like for for web audio. So what type of applications would you like to see people making? Uh, does it look like, would you like to see a future where it would be hybrid technologies mm -hmm. where you have native technologies interacting with um, with dolls in the browser or do you have something different in mind? What are you, what are you seeing in the future? Um, I thought like, the early days of uh, me working on Web Audio API was basically, yeah, we want to have all the nice and cool native audio apps on the web. That was kind of my personal mission when I worked on the Web Audio API. Uh, but now I'm seeing a little bit of different trends happening, and I really like it. Uh, one of the example is Figma. Uh, are you familiar with this application? Yeah, oh, it's yeah. A, it's, yeah, it's an it's application for designers, but it's completely web-based. Now many people are using it. It's not close to Adobe Illustrator. It's not really close to Adobe Photoshop, but somehow it became super popular. It's just its own thing. I think that every web app can be like that. So I think we have to think a little bit differently because you're in the browser and also it has its own limitation. There are some restrictions that you need to walk around, but also it's constantly connected with the backend and server it's because whole design of this browser is just based on the idea of a, like a connectedness, connectivity, right? So we need to maximize that, uh, the, the advantage to make, uh, to be successful in, in, in terms of creating web app. Um, also, if you look at the, a lot of like, music LM and or uh, audio music generation based on larger language model, they usually have a web page, right? Mm -hmm. They usually have a, some sort of a demo application on the web. Why is that? <laughs> it's, it's much easier to build. Also, it's really, really demonstrate the powerful thing with just like single click to the link. Mm -hmm. So I think there are, there are really a, a huge value in that uh, concept. So, yeah. yeah. So my interpretation of what, what I'm gathering from what you said there is that uh, our first instincts are maybe to try to replicate what we've done in native applications and bring those into and just replicate that behavior in the browser. Whereas maybe we should start looking in the direction of looking at the advantages that browsers bring us that we don't get in native applications and trying to build products and services around those. Is that what you're saying? Nice summary. Thank you, Josh. Yes. I just blabbering and you made a really nice summary of it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, where did the standard way of creating and destroying graphs instead of reusing them uh, come from? Is there a precedent in systems older than web audio? Hmm, let me think about that question. So creating and reusing the graph, I'm not sure I'm following that question because uh, in web audio, there is no way to reuse the graph once you destroy them. You have to recreate everything from scratch. Right, yeah. so, so this person is saying, is there a reason that, um, that this is the way that, that you have to do it. Uh, oh, so yeah, this this was a question that you emailed me maybe this uh, before this interview, no? Um, I'm not sure if it's from the same person, but- uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, so so they're saying, well, why can't we reuse the graph? Um, because uh, uh, 
yeah, I think the one aspect is uh, it was an intentional decision from the early design process of web audio API. So introspection is not possible by default. Uh, it, what I mean by that is once you create graph, there is no way for you to traverse the graph because the graph is internal structure that is used and rendered by the audio thread. Yeah. So that's, I think that is kind of an official answer. And uh, just to add more context to it, because the Web Audio API uses this dual threading architecture, so you create and you connect uh, audio graph and audio nodes in the main thread, but actual th rendering and actual connection is happening on the rendering thread. So it, it is a two different world. So if you try to introspect, if you try to investigate the nature of graph and connection from the main thread, it will always be late, right? And also by default, this creation and building graph is highly dynamic. You can actually change graph for every, every two milliseconds if you want. So your graph is dynamically changing, but you're trying to inspect that data from the other thread. That is by nature, it's kind of data race. Also the data you're gonna get from the other thread will not be accurate. So that's why we basically prohibited all the in, uh, uh, cross thread introspection. Got it. Yeah. Yes, you're saying because the because the main thread is not a real time thread that the data that data is always going to be behind what your what yep. is that currently right. happening. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I hope that answers uh, your question. Um, and that actually remind you actually kindly kindly reminded me that there was a question from somebody who asked um, the right. question before. And um, so I'll just read it out. It's a little bit of a longer question. Um, mm -hmm. and I hope everybody can follow. Um, so uh, the question is, I'm working on a simple FM synth with React.js and the Web Audio API as a final front end section project. The synth takes settings from a JSON file uh, stored in the back end as a service called uh, Superbase. I can fetch and change my settings with a rendered mm -hmm. UI, and I'd like to store web API nodes inside a main component to be able to con connect them freely in a modular way. Is there a way to find and access existing nodes in my app with the web audio API? So that kind of yeah. comes back to what you were saying, yes. right? Yeah, it's the same story. So uh, yeah. no, introspection is not possible. So you cannot uh, investigate what's already connected. But also it means that you have a full control over your source code for your project. So you, you already know what kind of graph that you're creating, right? So my recommendation for this kind of case is you already have a back, uh, a back end and you already have some, some sort of JSON file metadata for your, your, your uh, since modules. So you, can have, you, you have all the data so you can recreate graph from those data. Okay, looks like uh, looks like we've finally um, tired out our audience and they've they've run out of questions. Uh, Yay! If you, there are any <laughs> there are any more questions? Please type them through really quickly. Uh, in the meantime, we'll go ahead and start wrapping up. Hong Chan, thank you so much for this. Uh, this was very educational. I feel like I really know a lot more about uh, audio and the web than what I did at the beginning of the conversation, which was barely anything. So, uh, so this is really awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I'm happy to hear that. Also, it's, it's my ple pleasure to be here today. It was really uh, fun to uh, answer all these questions, but I would also like to point out that I'm, I'm pretty open to uh, like DM through Twitter or LinkedIn if you have any question or any kind of a, like partnership discussion. I'm open to it. So please reach out. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so Hong Chan is on, um, is on Twitter. Uh, you can also find him on LinkedIn as well. <clears throat> and, uh, I will be sure to put the links to his, uh, social media, uh, in the description, um, video description below after this talk is over. Um, uh, there is, there's a question here from Redetach who asks how well does the web audio API integrate with web frameworks such as react Vue, et cetera. Can you share uh, state amongst app components? 
Um, I'm not sure I have uh, enough expertise on this issue because I, I haven't used all different types of JavaScript framework. Um, I'm a platform engineer, so my job is usually writing C++ code for uh, Chromium. I do write uh, some testing for HTML JavaScript, and I when I do that, I don't rely on framework because I'm usually building examples and uh, demos for developers. So I just want to, I usually want to uh, keep, keep things really simple. So I'm sorry, but I don't have the right experience to answer that question correctly. Right. Okay. Uh, and if people, if there's somebody that's in our audience, I'm sure that there are some people that are saying, this sounds really exciting. I want to start building my web audio application uh, right now. Um, where do, where do people start? Um, is it that Mozilla link that you gave us earlier? Yeah. Also, I like to recommend a couple more links and probably these two. And first one here is our team's official uh, Chrome web audio example pages. So, uh, that has some, some of the canonical example, example for uh, audio workload and also some interesting demos and et cetera. And the second link is uh, one of the course that I'm uh, that are that I'm teaching in uh, Karma's uh, Computer Music Research Center, uh, Stanford Computer Music Research Center, and and this this GitHub repository ha has a lot of uh, basic web audio example that you can start with. Fantastic! Big shout out to right. Karma. Yep. And also, lastly, I like to share this link. Um, if you have uh, some burning question that you want to get answered right away about web audio, uh, I I urge you to uh, join our uh, Slack channel for web audio developers. There are so many people in the channel. So if you have any question, uh, some people might be able to answer that. Amazing. That sounds fantastic. Um, great. This is this has been very, uh, very insightful, Hong Chan. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks for having me, Josh. Yeah, no problem. And if and for anybody else that's here, uh, if you're looking for a place to continue studying, um, studying and um, talking about web audio or just about audio software uh, development in general, along with Hong Chan's Slack channel on web audio, we also have a web audio channel in our Discord. Um, so you can find that on the audio programmer. Uh, mm -hmm dot com forward slash community so we have a pretty thriving group over there and um yes this is great um thank you so much hong chan uh hope that we see you again soon all right thanks for having me josh yes have a great day